Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very excited to continue our discussion. So before jumping into the uh, main lecture, this is the logistics. So make sure to pick up the MCU dashboard, which is part of our lab four, and this is today's scrap duty. Okay, so let's get, get started with lecture 16, which is on device training and transfer learning part two. So remember in the last week, we talked about distributed training with a lot of GPUs, training on the cloud, how to tolerate long latency, and how to reduce the memory, but uh, reduce the network bandwidth. Uh, in this week, we are starting to talk about transforming on device learning. Okay? How do we enable um, us to learn new stuff on the edge? Okay? So from inference to training, uh, we have this virtual cycle. And right? so many ubiquitous AI applications, and then um, you can generate and collect a lot of new data every day like the self-driving car running on the, on the road, collecting a lot of, a lot of data. Um, so it'll be great if you can utilize this newly collected data to update the model locally on the edge device, right? Um, so be able to learn on the edge and enable customization, preserve the privacy, and uh, enable this continual, continuous lifelong learning, right? So this form a virtual cycle and attract more users. But we talk about training is much more expensive than inference due to the activation, due to the batch size, right? How do we conquer those problems? So we first discuss about this co-design for training, right? So first we start with algorithm side and then the system side. In the last lecture, we'll talk about these two parts. Okay? First of all, using quantization aware scaling to enable uh, quantized training using only uh, eight bit for training, right? We analyze the difference between weight and gradient, uh, and gradient and find that actually the quantized training due to the scaling factor, um, there's usually a big weight, but a very small tiny little gradient. And, the, and therefore we need a scaling factor uh, to compensate for that. This is um, hyperparameter free and very easy to implement just one line of code. We then talk about this sparse tensor and sparse layer update, where not all the layers are equal, right? We can selectively update, only update those for those uh, useful layers. And even for those layers, we can talk to partial update. Therefore, we can save the memory and the latency and the energy. Okay, we don't have to uh, move the entire chunk of data, but only uh, partial data. Uh, to determine which layer to update, we also discuss this uh, contribution analysis, right? How to decide which layer to update and which layer to keep fixed. So in today's lecture, we will talk about tiny tweeting engine. That is the implementation of all these novelties and algorithms, right? So that we can turn this theoretical saving into measured speed up and measured memory saving. So let's review about the training graph, right? So um, in back propagation, we have to first obtain this forward graph, okay? In this example, we have a math model, a C layer. We have data, we have weight, and then we have a one output. So how do we do the uh, backward? So here we uh, obtain this, uh, this, uh, this gradient, okay? And then uh, we uh, do the forward of the reverse direction as the forward graph and calculate two components. One is dy dx, the gradient with respect to the activation, which will be back propagated to the previous layer. And also the dy dw, which is the weight, uh, the, active, the gradient with respect to the weight. And finally, after we obtain two graphs, we can uh, and give the graph to the uh, to the execution engine. To conventional work, um, the forward graph is done in compile time, but to obtain this auto differentiation, this part is done in runtime. Right. So after um, the model is compiled, this is actually consuming the memory and also the latency during the runtime. So can we? Um, eliminate the need to perform these tasks in runtime and offload as much 
workload as possible to the compile time. So here are the drawbacks for auto diff uh, at the runtime. Um, it has high dependencies and pretty large binary size. Since you don't know which operator you are using, for example, if they're only um, using certain convolution layers, but since at compile time, you don't know which one you're going to use, uh, the binary size will pre be pretty large. Maybe it also includes several transformer layers, even though uh, we are not using them at all. And uh, the convention, uh, conventional tweening infrastructure, uh, those operators are usually optimized for the clock, right? For the GPU, uh, not for the edge. Therefore, we need also need customized kernels, okay? That is targeting on device streaming. Conventional approach is also heavy in memory, right? There is a lot of intermediate and even unused buffers during back propagation, which we are going to cover very soon. And conventional infra doesn't support this sparse back propagation. So in last lecture, we talked about this far spec of propagation for these convolutional neural nets, right? Not all layers are equal. Conventional wisdom is that we just update the last layer, okay, which actually hurts the accuracy. It is reducing a lot of memory, but it hurts the accuracy. And we find a good trade-off is to update only those intermediate layers, right? Remember the intermediate layers have neither big, mem uh, big memory for activation nor big memory for weight. Remember for the activation, um, is it more heavy in the early stage or later stage for the activation? Early stage due to the large resolution before done something, right? And for the, for the weight, usually it's, more, it's, it's heavier in later stage because of the large channel number, right? So actually updating those middle layers is a good trade-off. But for existing framework, you have to update, calculate the, the, whole, the whole gradient. Okay? There is no mechanism to do sparse spec propagation. Therefore, we need a customized infrastructure um, to support uh, sparse propagation. So this is our motivation to uh, offload a lot of runtime operation in red to uh, push them to compile time, right? So this is the actual execution latency and memory we have to, we have to pay um, at, at during training, right? And these are compiled, and are all done at the compile time, right? So we can um, offload most of the workload from runtime to compile time, okay? Thus minimize the runtime overhead um, and also support these opportunities for a lot of graph optimizations which can be done since these are all static, we can perform a lot of op uh, graph optimizations such as operator fusion and operator reordering, et cetera, during compile time. So here is a big picture and let's analyze the whole tuning graph step-by-step. Step. Okay. So with starting with a Python defined uh, PyTorch model okay, and we trace the static graph to obtain this forward graph. And then we calculate the derivatives at the compile time to obtain this backward graph. And we use the IR, which is intermediate representation. No matter what framework, what front end you use, TensorFlow or PyTorch, the IR is the same. Okay. We do this graph optimization, like, uh, like reordering or tensor fusion, um, to get an uh, updated, optimized IR intermediate representation. And then we tune the schedule since we already know the size of the workload, the dimension of the convolution, then we can tune the schedule for a particular device, like the um, hiding size, the loop ordering, etc. Right? Finally, we generate the code, the high performance code, uh, which will be executed uh, at training time. Okay, so a very heavy compile time operations, very thin uh, runtime over. So let's start with the first step. Okay. So starting with uh, these Python defined modules. Um, and I'll give you an insight what's the difference between uh, the Python defined module versus this forward IR. So let's briefly look at the code. Uh, in this lecture, we have very little, as little as possible code for you to get the intuition. But sometimes 
uh, we try to simplify it so it's easier to understand. So, for example, this model um, has only one layer. Okay, so this is the input data, uh, which is 22, 28 by 28 by three channels, super small image. And the network takes in the data output of, of the prediction. And the net is defined by only one layer, the sequential layer, which is a convolution layer, right? Only one layer. Uh, kernel size, which is uh, three, three input channels and three output channels. So we um, uh, parse that into a forward IR, okay, intermediate representation. Uh, it's telling, telling us um, this is a function that has an input, which is of shape 28 by 28 by three input channels. Okay? And it's also telling us what is the data type. Here is 14.34. Um, and the width tensor is three by three kernel, three input channels, and three output channels. Okay? It's also of type 14.34. And the operation is by performing count to D on the input with the weight. This is dimension for the padding. This is the number of channels. This is the kernel space. Okay? So that uniquely defines this operator. Okay? And the output is defined by a percentage zero. Finally, we pass that through a write function. So what's the difference between uh, uh, this high force representation versus this forward IR? What's good about this IR versus the high torch module? Right, the input dimensions and the, all the dimensions for the kernels so that you can do the optimizations, right? So here, when we are defining the model, um, we don't know what is count to be. We don't know what is the size of the input, what is the size of the output, right? It has to be determined by runtime. It gets passed with 28 by 28. Therefore, it knows that, okay, actually we have to instantiate a 2D convolution with 28 by 28 by 28 input. Well, on the other side, um, each tensor, we know the shape, the dimension, and also the data at the run time, at uh, compile time, right? Therefore, we can do all sorts of optimizations, like finally, right? We compile uh, the, the input in the XY dimension, we can do, do loop reordering, et cetera, all sorts of graph level optimizations. Right. We can also fuse this redo into the uh, convolution layer. Right. So that's the advantage of having um, this forward IR at compile time. Okay. And the next step is to, uh, from this forward graph, we want to obtain this backward graph. Okay. So here, the forward graph is the same as the previous slide. It's very simple. You have only one layer, which is count to D. Okay. Uh, taking uh, input, taking the weight. These are the dimensions of the input of the weight. And this is the kernel size. Okay? And suddenly the backward IR becomes more complicated. But let's analyze the one, one, line by line. Actually, it's not complicated at all. Okay? So forward is the same, and then come to the okay? input weight, padding. These are the dimensions. Right? Um, and also, we have two more. Uh, three more sections to so calculate the gradient with respect to the input so that you can back propagate to the previous layer right and the other component is the gradient with respect to the weight and the gradient with respect to the bias okay so to calculate the gradient to the input you need a count to the transpose okay? so uh, transpose count okay with the take into a take into uh, this original weight and also the gradient with respect to the output. Okay, you do this uh, transpose count with the kernel size, etc. Okay, so this is one major component. And the second major component, uh, you need another count to D that takes the input and also takes the grad output, the gradient with respect to the output. Okay? And then you can calculate the gradient with respect to the weight. Imagine if you are doing sparse layer update. Right? This layer, will, uh, uh, this part will be ignored since you are not updating the weight, the gradient with respect to the weight. Okay, so this is uh, gradient 
to the weight. Finally, we have the gradient with respect to the bias, which is simply summing uh, uh, the gradient with respect to the output, and it doesn't require storing any activation. Okay, so here only gradient weight requires to store the intermediate activation. Okay, calculating the bias doesn't require that. Calculating the gradient with respect to the input doesn't require storing the intermediate activation either. Okay, so as a very rough estimation, if forward uh, takes 10 milliseconds, uh, how long will it take on the same device for the backward, for the backward? Considering forward right, and gradient input and also gradient to the weight. So we have three convolutions for the entire forward and backward compared with only one convolution for forward. So it's three times, roughly three times longer with respect to uh, the base. Okay, so uh, let's go to the major part, the most exciting part. How do you port this sparse layer and the sparse tensor update? So we already obtained this IR, the intermediate representation for twin, right? Uh, we get the forward, the forward graph and also the backward graph. And also we know the dimensions of all the tensors. Okay, it's no longer dynamic, but it's static. It's already at no at the power times um, so that we can uh, determine what is the dimension we are going to update and what is going to be kept and fixed. So imagine this is uh, three or four scenarios. I will describe one by one, okay? So the first scenario is the full update. I'm going to update all the layers, the weight, also the bias, okay? Second one is well, how we update the bias. Third one is sparse layer update, not updating this one, only updating this one. Fourth one is sparse tensor update, okay? only updating partial uh, of the tensor. Okay. So given this forward equation, so y equal to xw times plus b, uh, the backward dy dx okay, equals to uh, the previous uh, gradient um, times uh, the w. Okay. So dy dw equal to the uh, g transpose times x and dy db is just summing the uh, summing the, the g together. So this is the uh, mathematical uh, representation. Okay. Uh, I believe there is a there should be a, a transpose here, which is a typo. We can fix that later. There should be a transpose. Um, so uh, this is the forward graph, right? So for the backward graph during the full update. We have to calculate all these uh, components, modifying um, one modifier, one transpose, another multiplier, another sum. Okay. So calculate dy dx, dy dw, and also dy dv. What if we have this bias only update? Right? So if bias up only update, uh, which line can we eliminate in this case? So we are only getting dy db, we don't need to, which one do we, can we eliminate? The dy dw one? Yes, the dy dw one, right? Since we are not calculating the gradient with respect to the weight, therefore we can uh, remove the the code to calculate dy dw. And the transpose operation can also be eliminated. What about if we do sparse layer update? Right? So here we have uh, a flag called red for the wave, for the bias, wave and bias. Right? So if a layer um, doesn't need to be updated, then we can set a flag that need red to be false for both scenarios. What about sparse tensor update? So here, uh, originally we have to calculate um, the gradient with respect to the weight and also the uh, the full weight, right? But currently, for example, here we only update half of the weight. So we 
right here, we give E squared to be 0 0.5. So here we can chop only half of the tensors, and the dimension is only uh, 10 by 10 rather than 20 by 10, okay? only uh, half of the total height. Okay? So here we can do the multiplication on the new tensor, which is of dimension 10 by 10 rather than originally 20 by 10. Therefore, we save half of the computation in this scenario. So these are the advantages of manipulating um, the graph at compound time. Yes, we know all the dimensions, we know all the tensor, all the data types. Therefore, you can feel free to have your own uh, scheme among these four schemes, right? Either bias only or sparse data update or sparse tensor update. Actually, this method is quite effective if you compare uh, the peak memory consumption uh, compared with a full update where you have to uh, back do back propagation all the way to layer one uh, on the microcontroller on different workload. So it can reduce the memory from thousands of kilobytes to only hundreds of kilobytes. Right? So it ranges from 6.5x reduction to 8.7x reduction just by uh, okay. and so uh, this is the example on uh, image classification tasks, right? So we also explored uh, such techniques on transformers running on BERT. And similar rule, similar method can also save the memory consumption on, on the lang language tasks like BERT. Okay. All right. So what are the other, other opportunities we can do? On the intermediate representation. We can also perform all prefer reordering and in place update. So we have seen this figure before during the distributed training section, right? So uh, we are, uh, this F stands for forward, P stands for backward, and U stands for update. Right? So, conventional way to update the parameters, we calculate. Uh, different layers, layer 0, 1, two, 3, and then we calculate the backward, get the gradient for layer 3, gradient for layer 2, layer 1, layer 0, and then we update layer 0, layer 1, layer 2, layer 3. Okay? So we form this uh, zigzag pattern. Right? Is this optimal? Um, are there opportunities to reduce the life cycle of the tensors? So here we have this big, pretty long cycle between the producer and the consumer, right? So we spend a lot of time, this tensor, uh, the gradient tensor has to store it, be stored in the memory before it is consumed, right? What about we just immediately consume this tensor as soon as the gradient is calculated, which is the second part. So we can immediately uh, do the update as soon as the backward is done for that layer is done. Or the second layer is not completely, it's not started yet, but it doesn't hurt us, doesn't prevent us from updating layer three because the gradient for layer three is already computed here. So we can immediately do the update and release the, uh, the space. And so we can free uh, this memory space and continue to do the layer two, right? After calculating the gradient of the tool, we immediately release uh, the buffer, update the, the, the weight, right? So we do that for layer one and layer zero uh, in a similar fashion. That's right. Why don't we just always do it that way? Hmm? Why don't we just always do it that way? Because it's better. Uh, so this is like what TensorFlow and PyTorch is currently doing, right? Um, the drawback here is you have to manipulate the um, um, we all, the update update the weight and also uh, to maintain the relationship between the whole schedule. So that's the conventional way you update you calculate the forward and then you calculate the backward, right? And after com com computing the whole um, backward, like step one, two, three, 
and then you do the updates all at once, right? So this is uh, very simple to write the code. If we do the conventional way, we calculate the loss, okay, and we calculate the gradient, and we update the gradient, right? So very simple code, but not efficient. Versus if we, uh, for, we do a simple for loop, and for measures in the model, we calculate the backward with, with respect to a particular layer, and then we immediately update that layer, and then we calculate uh, the loss for the previous layer, and we continue this process, putting loss here. Okay? It will do the other way, where we do forward, run two, and then uh, reading for the three uh, layer three, and then we immediately do the update. And then we calculate the gradient for this layer into the update, and etc. Right? So in this way, uh, the control logic is a little bit complicated, but not rocket science. But this greatly simplified the um, uh, the buffer and make it more memory efficient. Actually, this method can save the memory from 500 microbyte, uh, kilobytes to only 160 kilobyte. Okay, by, by such simple reordering. Uh, techniques. So these are three different models, a bigger one, a middle one, and a smaller one, right? So by such reordering and in-place updates, we can uh, drastically reduce the peak bandwidth. So actually, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit uh, using such seems very simple techniques compared with the existing PyTorch and TensorFlow methods. So uh, a caveat here is that we are running on just a couple of kilobytes, yeah, right? yeah. but the main bottleneck when you have a batch size that is consumed by your activation size, which is not here we are just using batch one mm -hmm. of training. Right. So therefore, in the tiny scenario, this kind of uh, reordering, this kind of uh, uh, memory for the gradient matters. But we are training large scale language models where the activation matters, the activation will dominate. And this method will not save the memory for activation, only save the memory for the gradient. Yeah. All right. So here we did some further analysis by running this operator's live cycle analysis. So what is live cycle analysis? Um, to see each buffer, what is uh, the start time and the end time for the buffer, right? So this is the total number of cycles. Uh, this is the live cycle in the X axis. You can see after the optimization, uh, all the operators that finish at about 200 cycles versus 240 cycles, right? And the Y axis, it's showing the size of the total number of buffers. Okay, um, so the weight have to be reside have to reside in the memory the entire time, right? So uh, these yellow parts are for inference. Okay? So inference uh, started at cycle zero, finished around cycle um, cycle sixty or eighty, right? Um, so a majority of the uh, the memory is consumed at uh, training time by the activation by the uh, gradients, okay, and also the activations. So by using such operator fusion, we can uh, reduce the memory consumption by this tensor. Okay? So actually, we are fusing um, the tiling and reshape operators together with uh, those convolution layers. Okay? So we fuse them into a single uh, uh, single operation. We can also do such in-place gradient update so that we can avoid having such long cycle and long memory of storing those gradient since we are applying the update immediately after we calculate the gradient. And as a result, we can shorten the total training time and also lower, greatly lower the total memory footprint. Okay, so having optimized the IR, remember we talked about this operating reordering, we talked about um, this sparse update. Now we can obtain a graph. We know all the dimensions. We removed all the redundant computations. Finally, we can tune the schedule. Okay? Tune the schedule means um, we 
fine tune the blocking size, the loop orders, et cetera, given a particular hardware platform. Um, so existing operators like Tensor Go Lite are optimized for this mobile, um, mobile CPUs but on microcontrollers that require a totally different uh, schedule. Okay? So uh, this is the uh, uh, performance uh, after tuning. Okay? We find such an uh, optimized operator uh, can make it uh, 23 to 25 times faster than the original um, Tensor Go Lite Micro. On the mic on the MCU. Okay, so we require only a couple of hundred milliseconds, okay, only a couple of hundred milliseconds to do the uh, forward and backward. For example, uh, running MCU net is roughly uh, uh, process two images per second. Okay, okay finally, uh, this is the last part. We can generate the binary by only using compiling those operators that is used in the graph. For other operators, if you didn't use any five by five kernel, we don't have to compile them at all, right? So we can have deliver a very lightweighted, portable, and efficient binary. On the microcontroller, we have only about one megabyte of flash. That's a very small amount of uh, resource. So even the binary size matters. So it's very crucial to have a very lightweighted um, a memory footprint for the binary size. Okay, so this is all, uh, another comparison of our conventional training frameworks okay, that performs most of the tasks at, at the runtime, which is in red. But the workload is in uh, 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 runtime, including uh, the auto diff at the run. But tiny training engine separate. Um, the runtime and the compile time, uh, the compile time and the run. Okay, we are pushing a lot of workload during the compile time, okay? including sparse update, fusion, and reordering, uh, so that we can finally generate the code that's very lightweight. Um, so with the same accuracy, this is the memory saving. Uh, this is the acceleration result. So quite effective, twenty x smaller memory and 23x faster speed. And here we have a... No, we will take a few oh, simple images so the for these two activities of and non device training. We have two buttons on the microcontroller, which is the same one you will be using for lab four. Hopefully you already pick up one of these ICM microcontrollers. Two classes, therefore two buttons. We click the button to give it a label, okay? And point it to another, another thing to give another um, label for the orange. Now we no longer need any inputs, any labels. We can automatically differentiate different classes. But the headache here is that you have to have these buttons to provide the input. Right, so can we have unsupervised or even self-supervised learning? So in the recent, uh, our recent work, we also explored uh, training, fine-tuning these language models. Right? For example, on the iPhone, we can uh, train our own text by analyzing the emails, right? Therefore, we can actually customize the language model for different users. And we find that such sparse update technique can also apply for the self-supervised self scenario to train those language models. Um, this is another uh, demo uh, we have seen before. We can run uh, 1.8 frames per second on the microcontroller. Um, feel free to uh, use this. We can give you the source code if you want to uh, work on your final product based on similar uh, techniques. Okay, so after a couple of epochs of training, we can run the new task, which is detecting person versus no person. Detecting person is quite important in a lot of IoT applications for smart home. Like you can uh, trigger uh, the music, trigger uh, the camera to record the, 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 the room only when you are seeing a person. Like previously, uh, people use this kind of motion trigger, but even the falling leaf can trigger the um, uh, 
uh, the video to be recorded, which is not accurate. And using such technique, we can accurately uh, determine whether this person or the person is in the scene. So for such tiny on-device training technique, we can match the uh, tiny ML perf benchmarks accuracy by purely tuning on the edge. Okay, so far we've talked about um, on-device training on very extremely memory-consuming devices like microcontrollers, right? So uh, we want to expand the application scenario beyond microcontroller to other uh, edge devices. Right. And also, we want to expand it beyond uh, commonness or also transformers, as we mentioned. So, diverse models, diverse applications, ranging from commonness to transformers, which is a hot topic recently, and also diverse one ends, which is high torch tensorflow, and also JAX, which is uh, very popular recently. And also, we want to support diverse backends, ranging from Android phones, Raspberry Pis, Apple M1. Qualcomm Snapdragon SOC and other uh, edge devices. So, tiny training engine provide a very versatile bridge between diverse models, diverse front ends, and also diverse hardware platforms. And the idea is that similar auto differentiation as we call time, through the graph to uh, remove those redundant operators for stars at provision, fusion and reordering to see if the building memory. And we also did another uh, other functional preserving optimizations. For example, the um, Winograd convolution, which we will cover in the next lecture. So conventionally, Winograd convolution is only used in inference because the weight has to be constant, right? But for training, conventional updates will change the weight. Therefore, we cannot calculate the Winograd transformation very easily. But with sparse update. We, uh, we can actually do the uh, forward for those fixed non-updated weights in the Reno web uh, format, which can accelerate the inference and also accelerate the forward, uh, and also accelerate the forward and backward stage because the weights, some of the weights are fixed. And tiny training engine uh, is showing quite good result on Raspberry Pi, for example, we can actually to about 10 images per second uh, for MCU net, about 9.5 frames per second for mobile naming tool. Okay. Um, so total latency of running uh, forward and backward using 224 by 224 resolution is only a hundred milliseconds on a small Raspberry Pi. The forward itself is about 30 milliseconds, uh, which is pretty exciting. You can do a lot of stuff using the Raspberry Pi. Uh, if you need one of those devices like Raspberry Pi, feel free to talk, talk to us if you want to use it for uh, final project. Uh, even for FERC, right, we can um, perform uh, about three to four sentences uh, per second. Even for the super, we can roughly um, process seven sentences per second on a tiny Raspberry Pi between the uh, fine tuned money models. And here, if you compare the red one versus this, this blue blue bars, we can find actually the full bit back propagation versus uh, the sparse spike propagation, where the sparse spike propagation can have quite significant improvement with respect to the uh, latency right? from six frames per second to about nine frames per second. Um, so here we can use it for diverse hardware platforms. This is very likely if you want to do uh, a home uh, final project, you can either use a mobile phone. Okay? Here we use the Qualcomm Snapdragon Agent One SoC, or you use the NVIDIA FGS Nano mobile GPU. Okay? Or you can use a uh, uh, cheaper Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi 4B Plus. Okay? And this is showing uh, what we can do on these devices. So on the CPU, um, this is the dense update versus the sparse update. Uh, this part is the the, the, uh, the the gray part is the forward part, and the red part is the backward. Right. So without optimization, uh, it's roughly taking 180 milliseconds to process the forward and backward for one image. Um, using sparse updates, it can uh, take only 90 milliseconds. Roughly 10 frames per second 
between 10 images per second on the uh, S -Gen, uh, S Gen 1 CPU with MobileNet V2. Okay, so on the DSP, so this SOC has a uh, CPU, uh, DSP, and also GPU, right? So DSP is much more faster. For example, with MobileNet V2, it takes only one millisecond in our experiment to run the forward and backward for one 24 by 24 image. Although currently there's one more bottleneck since the infrastructure doesn't uh, allow this update. So we can calculate the gradient, but we cannot do the gradient update, which is not a, is a very low hanging fruit, but we haven't solved it so far. But if that is solved, it's super promising to train uh, to do on-demand training. A thousand images per second on the DSP. Currently it's about 10 frames per second on the CPU. So on the Jason Nano, um, it's requiring only about five, six milliseconds to train one image. So it's very likely to you do a homework, do a final product by using Jason Nano um, to uh, try some new ideas, right? Build some applications. Our Raspberry Pi is similar, um, about 90 uh, milliseconds uh, to, to the forward and backward. And Spar's update is consistently uh, showing the benefits about 1.7 to 1.9 x speed up uh, for training on device. Some highlights on the MIT news there is a cool technique to enable AI models and continually learn from new data on intelligent edge devices like smartphones and sensors reducing the energy costs, privacy risks, um, makes deep learning more accessible. All right, so uh, this is a summary of the take home for on device training, where there are three components, right? Quantization, uh, sparse update, and system support, any training engine. On the quantization part, we mentioned uh, the fake quantization has to, keep, has, has to keep the FP32 counterpart um, uh, in the memory, right? It is designed for uh, a quantization aware fine tuning but not designed for quantized training. Okay, quantization where fine tuning is targeting inference. Okay, training uh, the quantized graph for inference. But at inference time, you don't have access to any floating point units. Uh, say some low uh, low end device. Right, thus such fake quantization doesn't uh, isn't possible. But quantizing uh, quantized training on real quantized graph is difficult. Um, the uh, difficulty is actually coming from the mismatch between uh, the weight and gradient for uh, the gradient for the weight and bias right, due to the scaling factor. So with quantization aware scaling, which is very simple, no hyperparameter tuning, just one or two lines of code, you can actually make it converge, okay? make quantized, uh, directly optimize those quantized graphs. So uh, sparse learning. Okay, so sparse learning happens in human brain, right, from two to four years old to adolescence. Uh, similarly, for, similarly for artificial neural nets, we can update only those important layers and only do partial updates. But we need system support in order to convert, to realize such um, theoretical saving into measured speed up and measured memory saving. So we, uh, we are going to use this technique where we are we are going to calculate the gradient at compile time, okay? On the device compile time to minimize the runtime overhead, okay? And use tiny training engine to fit uh, the, the overall training on the microcontroller. So when we talk about a lot about uh, on-device training, so um, is it safe to perform on-device training? Since we are exchanging the gradients, we are exchanging the models, we are not exchanging the data, does that prevent us from actually leaking the raw data? And we are going to show several techniques try to uh, leak the raw training data from the gradient, which is very interesting. Okay, so uh, this motivation for on device training, which is the same as before, right? We motivate for um, customization, say people may have different accents, right? Um, but also security is very important. The data shouldn't leave um, the device, especially for sensitive data like in hospitals or where there are regulations. 
Um, so this is the background for federated learning. Um, why do we need federated learning where different devices are using its own local data to uh, update its own model? And they only exchange the model update rather than exchanging um, the training data. And the reason is because of the privacy of the data. The data is everywhere. You want to fully utilize different sensors, different uh, different devices to collect them, but they are usually isolated due to the privacy issue or due to regulation issue. So, federated learning provides a way to utilize all of this uh, decentralized data without having to centralize them, like we uh, discussed in the last week's lecture. So, this is uh, the uh, popular Fed average algorithm, which is one we use for uh, input methods. And so different people may have uh, different vocabulary, uh, different contacts. Right? So when you are testing something, it's trying to learn a customized model uh, for your habits. Right? So it starts with a user, uh, with a model, and get some data to update the model. So this is the updated model from a particular user, right? And you may have multiple such users represented by multiple forms here. So they initially get the same model uh, from Apple Store, for example. Okay? After a while, uh, each of them may have completely different models since different user may have different data, different habits. Right? Um, so they exchange the model rather than exchange the data. So finally, we have a new, uh, new model, okay, which will be uh, aggregated and disseminated, which will be aggregated and then disseminated and averaged on the server, sent back to different devices. So uh, this private user data never leaves uh, these edge devices. So they're actually averaging the model rather than averaging or exchanging the data. But does this really protect the user information? So we want to rethink the safety of widgets since we are exchanging them. So convolutional neural nets given to different images, we can have different predictions, and we can uh, derive gradients from model and train data to get a gradient, which is the normal training process. So given we try to answer the question, given the gradients. Does the gradient contain the information of the raw training data? Intuition tells us it does because gradient is calculated by <coughs> uh, using the inputs, right? Therefore, it must be containing some of the information from these inputs. And the question here is whether we can recover the input image by using these gradients. Let's brainstorm for one minute to think about this question. Can we try to steal, to recover, to leak the input image by observing the gradients? What are you assuming that the adversary can input anything they want into this black box and then just integrate it as the output? Yeah, you can imagine you can give any input to the system. You could probably <laughs> reconstruct it in a new gradient because if you use like an auto encoder structure, I feel like the answer is the same. If you have an auto encoder structure, the auto encoder's input is the input image, but now you only have the gradients. Uh, so, what's the input for the auto encoder? Somehow the gradients. Somehow the gradients. The array of the photo. Uh, I don't know how, but I'm convinced it can happen. Intuitively, that uh, auto encoder can recover the input image, but this is the gradient, like exactly not the input, uh, not the image. Okay. I think the question should be reversed prove that you cannot create <coughs> data using the gradient, not prove that you can't. Can uh, actually, we can do that, but here the question is how can we do that? So I'm going to show you the result very soon, but hopefully, we can do some brainstorm to see. Given this gradient, how to recover it? Um, I guess if the adversary knows which classes they're looking for, 
and the adversary has their own cats, dogs, etc. And they um, just feed those in, get a set of gradients out, and they do some sort of king or neighbors or some other um, try to match the gradient that they observe somehow to the set that they generated to see where it maps to the closest. Yeah, very close. You mentioned match the gradient, right? So we can generate some uh, random input, random labels, and try to match. We can obtain a gradient and try to match the gradient with the original input gradient. And then we can do back propagation to optimize to be fake the adversarial input and the label. That's exactly the method. So let's see how that happens. Okay. Um, so before that, let's see some weaker solution where we try to find whether data points belong to the batch, right? So this is a weaker uh, way of trying to steal the input data from uh, the gradient. And it's showing that actually we can get whether an input belongs to the training data or it doesn't belong to the training data. We can even uh, find whether a data point with certain property is in the training data. Say whether someone wearing a gray suit is in the training data, then it can tell you whether that is uh, in the training data. But uh, both these methods is kind of weak because it only uh, tell you whether some uh, data point exists or uh, some certain property exists, they cannot steal the raw data. So um, these are called membership inference or property inference. So um, since gradient contains so much information about the training data, can we just obtain the raw training data, the raw image from these gradients? Actually, this is exactly the method. So given a normal participant, and here we have a malicious attacker, given the original cat image, given uh, we pass it through this differentiable model, okay, uh, with weight W, uh, get a prediction, at the same time, we get the loss so that we can calculate the gradient with respect to the weight, right? Okay? Since we have the, uh, uh, the ground truth label, we can. Uh, calculate the loss, therefore we can calculate uh, the gradient. So this is the normal participant. And there's a malicious attacker, right? Uh, so the attacker initialize a random input. This is just random input. And this is a random output, random label, okay? So what it's going to do is basically pass through this, um, uh, uh, this input image into the same model okay, with the same W okay, and get a, uh, a prediction slash that. Right? So this is the uh, attacker's uh, prediction given this random input. Using the prediction and the random output, we can calculate a loss with respect to the weight. Right? And here we are trying to match the loss um, and trying to match the gradient to make this um, uh, gradient to be the same as the original uh, normal participants gradient, right? So here we can uh, try to match these two gradients by calculating um, the, the difference of these two delta w, and then we back propagate uh, this loss to update the input and also update the uh, the random output, right? by trying to match these two gradients. So we can calculate the loss, loss right? We can use this loss to back propagate to the input and back propagate to the, to the output. Okay, so we can tune um, the input. And after a couple of iterations, we can actually recover the image. So, so, so let's see that in, in, in the code, in a concrete manner. We initialize the input to be random noise, okay, random noise. We also initialize the output to be random noise. Okay? And after that, we try to calculate the loss okay, using this input, using this output. Okay? We try to uh, calculate the, uh, the loss, therefore the gradient with respect to the weight using the dummy in, input and dummy output. After that, uh, we calculate the distance between the normal participant and malicious attacker's gradient. 
thing we call it a loss, and then we can update the dummy input and also the dummy output uh, using uh, this loss and try to uh, minimize the loss by tweaking the dummy output and the dummy input. And by after a couple of such iterations, then we can recover the input. So this is the um, effect. Okay. So let's. This is our case. So we have an initial uh, random initialization, right? So this is the recovered image. This is the ground truth image. So. Initially, the recovered image is purely noise, but after a couple of iterations, it's going to uh, recover the input image. How many uh, forward passes does this take? Just over a Is this like on the order of 10, 100? Like, yeah. Yeah, so on the other order of 10, right? So this is another example, right? Iteration zero, what, 10, 20, uh, 30 iterations. So initially, we initialize something with a purely random noise, uh, purely noise sentence. Okay, this is the original text we get from the new RIPS website. Registration volunteer application and student travel application open the first week of September. Healthcare will be available. Right, we try to attack by stealing the raw input sentence. Uh, first, initializing a random input. And to back propagate, try to match the gradient. Okay, since we can obtain the gradient, we try to match the gradient. Uh, iteration 10, iteration 20, it's already uh, almost there. Now, for 30 iterations, I can actually uh, recover the full sentence. What, what is assuming here? This is assuming we can obtain both the weight and the gradient, right? Say if a mobile app, uh, Apple Store, you do have the weight, right? And if we exchange the gradient, it is also possible to get other gradients. So be careful about your gradient, not only the data. What about some defense strategy? Is there a way to prevent such leakage of the gradient, no, of the of the data from gradient? Let's brainstorm a little bit. This is adding noise. Um, let me start with something that doesn't work and then I'll give you the time to think about something that will work. One of the major assumptions here is that the model is deterministic. Every time you put an input, you're going to get right. put in the same input twice, you get the same gradient twice. Right. But could you make the model not deterministic? To its Very good point. Time? You can actually use the once for all network. At different time, you are sampling a different sub network, right? And you don't know, the attacker may not know which subnetwork you are actually using. Um, therefore, you do have the full weight, but you don't know which partial weight you are using. So in that case, what are we trying to break? Uh, we are trying to break the W, right? Here, the W, here, and W. The W for the participant, normal participant, versus the W for the malicious attacker are actually assuming they have the same weight. But if they don't have the same weight, it might be possible uh, to uh, prevent that, but that might require some experiments. So um, just a direction, I haven't done that. So I cannot say 100%, but that's a good direction. Wouldn't this not occur with batch size? I know you said batch size is where you can still infer if the specific shape is in the batch size, but Right, that's another good point. If you increase the batch size, right, it's like you're solving an equation. There are so many parameters to solve, but there are just limited number of functions available, right? We are trying to match the gradient, which is a fixed number of dimensions in the gradient, right? What if we have a super big chunk of images, so many pixels? So calculate each pixel will be harder and harder. Like you have, if you have only two equations, but you are trying to solve uh, two variables, that's doable. But if you're increasing a lot batch size, that is equal to you are having two equations, but you're trying to solve like um, 10 variables, then suddenly the, 
it becomes very difficult. So definitely that's another way to prevent such attack. Very good point. So let's see some uh, intuitive method, but actually it doesn't work. Um, adding noise, right? We can add noise, get okay, both original model, add some noise, adding more noise. Okay. Um, actually, after adding the noise, um, for example, adding 10 to the minus three, um, after a couple of iterations, uh, this is the gradient uh, match loss. We, uh, we can still leak, but with some uh, artifact. So when we are not leaking the information, actually the accuracy is actually getting pretty, pretty bad. So neither Gaussian or Laplace noise can defend uh, the leakage unless we can tolerate serious accuracy drop. Uh, what about using quantization, like half precision? Um, even by using a P16, uh, we can still observe uh, depleted if we recover the input image and the tree. Uh, similarly, uh, this is for using pruning. Right? So actually pruning is a way to uh, solve this method. Why pruning can, uh, gradient pruning, uh, why gradient compression can effectively protect the, uh, the, the privacy leakage and why do we need sparsity ratio to be larger than a certain number. So here we are showing uh, the grid mesh loss uh, with the original model um, and this is proving one uh, percent right still deep uh, leakage proving about 20 percent is being leaked with some artifact uh, if you do more like this purple line, so 70% is not going to uh, fit the information. And the reason is that if we are pruning the gradient, when we are trying to match the gradient, it's like you have less equations, match, less matches, right? But you have the same amount of um, parameters to solve. So you have less uh, clue what to match. Right? You're trying to match the gradient, but suddenly, most of the gradients, uh, more than 30% uh, of the gradients are pruned. So therefore you have less clue. Okay? It's like you are sending uh, less uh, information to, to, your, uh, to the malicious attacker. And therefore it's less likely uh, to attack them. And another limitation is that you see all the images are pretty, has pretty low resolution, okay? for example, uh, in this demo, the resolution are all pretty low. We find it harder and harder to attack high resolution images. And why is that the case? Right, the number of gradient is fixed. Right. If you have a larger input resolution versus a smaller resolution, the gradient size is equal, always equal to the model size, which is irrelevant of the resolution. Right. But if you have a larger input resolution, uh, you need to attack more pixels. Right. You have to uh, calculate more pixels, but you have the same number of equations, which is equal to the number of uh, the, the size of the gradients. Right. Therefore, it's hard to leak a lot of information with a large resolution using the same amount of input, uh, in the same amount of input information, which is the number of gradients. So that's similar reason why it's harder to attack a larger batch size. So compared with, uh, it's harder to attack with a larger resolution. Okay, so hopefully that provides an interesting perspective to rethink the safety of gradients, rethink um, the safety of exchanging gradients, exchanging model updates. All right, so this is a summary for this uh, this week. Okay, we talk about algorithm system algorithm system co-design for on device training, including quantization, and also sparse updates, and also the system support. We also introduced uh, a major part of this lecture why federated learning is because of data, right? 
uh, data never leave the big device and only exchange the gradient and models that allow story and tuning uh, without exchanging data. But we want to rethink the safety of this uh, paradigm by examining uh, the possibility of attacking, leaking the input image by examining the, the gradient. Okay. Conventional wisdom is showing that uh, we can only leak those uh, high level information like membership or certain properties, but deep leakage from gradient, our new uh, 19 paper is showing is actually possible to leak the original, the full original full image for, uh, and also the text from uh, the grid. And a very effective way to prevent uh, such uh, leakage is by using grid compression and grid pruning. Okay. So hopefully this lecture is helpful for your final projects, giving you more opportunities and to do um, a more interesting uh, project, not only inference, but also training. Uh, all the devices we described in the lecture, we have them available in the lab. So if you need devices, need those devices, feel free uh, to contact us. And we are happy to uh, help you to brainstorm uh, exciting ideas. Okay. So next lecture, we'll continue to talk about Tiny Engine, which will be used in our lab call. So I hope you can all come to the next lecture. Thank you.